I'm David Biggs, author of Quagmire, Nation Building and Nature in the Mekong Delta. This book is at its heart a story about the struggles of governments to develop public infrastructure and establish their authority in remote frontiers. Using the lens of environmental history, I argue that we may better grasp the accomplishments, the catastrophes, and the residual influences of state schemes by assessing their historical connections to the land. The Mekong Delta, with its intricate watery maze of rivers, canals, and arroyos, offers a rich vantage point for studying challenges to state authority within Vietnam's turbulent past. Encompassing over 50,000 square kilometers of wetlands in southern Vietnam and eastern Cambodia, the Mekong Delta is today an economic powerhouse in Southeast Asia. Delta rice and other products have played a key role in Vietnam's current economic boom. Like the American frontier, the Delta's promise of agricultural riches and open land has attracted wave after wave of settlers since the late 1700s. This long history of public and private land development in the Delta has resulted in the gradual conversion of several million hectares of swamps and mangroves into a quasi-urban water grid that now supports a population of more than 20 million people. As a source of potential riches, the Delta also attracted the attentions of many states. From the Vietnamese Kingdom in Hue in the 1700s, to the French Navy in 1860, to Vietnamese nationalists in the 1930s, to the Cold War superpowers in the 1960s, and finally many national and international agencies today. Thus over two centuries, virtually every world power has sent its entrepreneurs, experts, and soldiers here to participate in the Delta's economic development. In this turbulent international history, hydraulic engineers and hydraulic technology has played a central role. After completing the Suez Canal, French engineers brought their steam-powered dredgers to the Delta to engage in one of the most ambitious reclamation efforts of the 20th century. As with railroads in other places, canals here led to a rapid opening of new land for plantations and settlements. However, by the 1930s, it was clear they had moved too quickly and could not maintain this infrastructure. Political troubles combined with environmental decline to produce a crisis where Vietnamese nationalist groups such as the Indochinese Communist Party began fervently organizing tenant farmers and building bases in the Delta's remaining swamps. In the 1950s and 60s, the fragile hydraulic infrastructure and these swamps became key battlegrounds of the Indochina Wars. French, American, and South Vietnamese military forces battled against the insurgents led by the Viet Minh and later the National Liberation Front across broken dikes, muddy fields, and dense brush. One American journalist, traveling through a government-controlled area in 1968, wrote, To the Americans, Vietnam is a counterinsurgency laboratory, alive with new projects and new ideas. But to the people in the hamlets, Vietnam is a counterinsurgency graveyard, overgrown with weeds and speckled with monuments, abandoned model settlements, forts, and refugee camps. With nature thus playing a more prominent role in this history, I revisit an old American metaphor of the war in Vietnam as a political quagmire and ask what are the real quagmires, the canals, swamps, and fields where the war took place? This book challenges conventional histories of Vietnam, colonialism, and the Cold War by arguing that the fate of nations was intimately tied to the fate of nature. The designs of states were situated within ecologically dynamic historical places where engineers, soldiers, and others attempted to carry out their plans. As with rivers and tides, these historical relationships that bind the state to nature continue to play out in the present and on into the future.